Hello, welcome to everyone joining this British Museum event, wherever you are in the world. I'm Michael Lewis, um, I'm Head of Portable Antiquities and Treasure at the British Museum. And today I'm joined by Dave Musgrove, who's Content Director for BBC History magazine. Um, today we're going to have a conversation um, about the Bayer Tapestry. Um, Dave and myself have recently written a book on the Bayer Tapestry, which we'll probably talk about a few times in this uh, in, in this show. Um, but it's it, it's obviously something that's very dear to both of our hearts, and we love the opportunity to talk to you and um, talk with you um, about this masterpiece of of medieval art. Anyway, I'm going to hand over now to Dave because he's going to sort of get us started. But what we're essentially going to do is not talk through the whole of the tapestry, but kind of pick various themes really um, to talk about. Cool. Right. Thanks, Michael. Uh, and what I'm going to do is click on the next slide. So hopefully that's moved along. So the first of our topics that we're going to talk about is the design and production of the bio tapestry, which is really, really interesting. Um, and before we get into it, I'm going to just going to offer a few basics about it. And when I say basics, um, there is a, a problem with the tapestry in that we don't really know too much about anything. We can't say anything definitive about most of it, but we can make some educated guesses. First thing to say, as I'm sure lots of you listening will know, it's an embroidery not a tapestry, uh, which means that it's it's stitched woolen woolen wool stitched into a linen background. Uh, so that's a, an embroidery. A tapestry would be a woven device. The reason uh, that it's called a tapestry, it's kind of a, a malapropism um, that dates back to the 18th century when a, a French antiquarian called Bernard de Montfacon described it as a tapisserie, and that kind of word has stuck in English. And and so we we continue to talk about it as a tapestry, and we will no doubt talk about as a tapestry throughout. Um, you'll no doubt know that it depicts the Norman Conquest, 1066, when William the Conqueror defeated King Harold II of England at the Battle of Hastings. Uh, in terms of the date of the tapestry, most tapestry experts would agree that it was probably made close to the events it depicts. Uh, Michael and I would argue that uh, it's, it's pretty specific in the, in the mid uh, 1070, so 1072 to 1077, there's a specific reason which we'll talk about in a minute, no doubt. What it shows is a, a narrative story of the run up to and the events of the Battle of Hastings um, uh, in a frame by frame format in a central freeze, that's where the action happens, and then there are upper and lower borders which show images which may or may not be related to what's going on in the central action. Uh, in terms of dimensions, it's uh, about 70 metres long, so 200 foot, so very long, uh, but quite narrow, only half a metre or so uh, in, in depth. Um, so it's an amazing survivor that it's, it's managed to stick with us uh, all this time. And in terms of how of, of the structure of it, it's composed of nine separate panels that were um, stitched uh, uh, separately, independently, and then would have been stitched together uh, when it was created. And then hopefully, what you can see here is, is someone doing a little bit of stitching. Um, so Michael, have I, got, uh, have I got the basics right? What else would you like to talk about in terms of the production and the making of the tapestry? Yeah, I think one of the things obviously that we know about the Bayer Tapestry is that we don't know much, um, like you said. And one thing though we probably can be a bit certain about is that the tapestry was probably made by women. And we'll probably talk about women um, a little bit later on. How many women? Were involved in the production of the tapestry and how long they took to make it we've really got no idea um, whatsoever um, and indeed of course there's probably a designer generally speaking we talk about the designer as if it was a man um, that's probably the case based on what we know about um, producing these objects at this sort of period of time but we don't know for certain whether they were an anglo-saxon or a Norman, it could have been, in fact, more than one person involved with the, the design and the production of the tapestry in terms of its overall kind of um, uh, design, as it as it were. But the but it, women, it was I, I would say is the the kind of principal people that are working on this 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 object. And the other thing I should have said, obviously, um, is that it's called the Bio Tapestry because it resides in Bayer in Normandy. Uh, we were just discussing whether we're pronouncing it right. I'm going for Bayer um, and, and we'll stick with that. Um, uh, and we know that it's been there, um, or at least we can we assume it's been there for most of its existence. Um, the, the, there are some question marks over its its life story, but it's definitely there now uh, in, a, in a museum, which is probably going to be redeveloped at some point in the near future. 
Um, right, let's jump on to the next slide, which shows a bit of the tapestry. Um, and you can see, uh, so on the on the left of your screen, I think that's is that the way you're looking at it, probably, uh, that you, there's a, a chap um, coming down a rope from a castle, uh, and the rope seems to be sort of defying uh, the basic properties of physics with the way that it's stretching down there. Um, and then next to it is another image, which is not of the biotapestry. So, Michael, what is the other image and why are we showing that? Yeah, so what we've got here is a, an um, Anglo-Saxon, a late Anglo-Saxon illumination called the Old English Hexatute, which now lives in the British Library. Now, the Bayer Tapestry, it seems pretty likely, um, the designer, I should say, of the tapestry was borrowing from lots of different manuscripts. And it's almost certain that he borrowed from the Old English Hexatute, but there's a few other manuscripts that he, he probably borrowed from as well. At the moment, I'm doing a bit of research with colleagues from Durham to kind of understand the relationship a little bit scientifically, I guess, um, between the Old English Hexatute and the Bayer Tapestry. But the, the thrust of the, the point here really is that the designer of the tapestry was borrowing from Anglo-Saxon manuscripts. And most of these manuscripts seem to be ones that were produced or housed in Canterbury Scriptoria. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, where the tapestry was produced um, in a moment or could have been produced. So, so there's stylistic similarities between the, that, that manuscript and some other manuscripts and, and the tapestry, right? Yeah, so what you get is you get two things really. You get stylistic similarities with Anglo-Saxon, late Anglo-Saxon illuminations, and you also get um, actual motifs that seem to be borrowed from one manuscript and inserted into parts of the tapestry. What we see here is um, Conan, um, who's um, the Duke of um, Brittany, escaping um, from the castle from a castle um, in the Bayer Tapestry. So it's a completely a, com a complete sequence of events, I suppose, in tapestry that most people don't really talk about, which is this campaign into Brittany. But anyway, that's a bit of a dist distraction, and we probably won't talk about that too much tonight. Okay, and then the Hexateuch scene is a completely separate scene. This is an Old Testament scene uh, from the the walls of Jericho, isn't it? So it's uh, but but they're but they're following the 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 line of of, of content that uh, that's shown. There. Yeah, so in, it's quite interesting actually because what we have here is two um, spies. Israelite spies escaping from the walls of um, Jericho. So another kind of thought that you know I, I sort of have about the Bayer Tapestry is to what extent are these images borrowed with imbued meanings with them, or are they just borrowed because they are useful kind of illustrations of people escaping for castles, for example. So moving on, so sort of stylistically, as you said, uh, the tapestry. Um, shows lots of evidence of being uh, of following Anglo-Saxon manuscript style. So that's one of the reasons why people say it was made in England. Um, and specifically, people say it was made in Canterbury. And one of the reasons is because it seems to follow those manuscript sources that we know were in Canterbury. And the image that we can see here is, is one of the monastic houses or the, the remains of it in Canterbury, um, a place that you can still go and visit today and, and is, is well worth a visit. Um, so there is much debate about this, about where the tapestry was made, but most scholars, I think, would agree now that it that Canterbury is uh, the most likely place. Yeah, that's right. And of course, there's some people have suggested that the tapestry was produced in Bayer or other parts of Normandy for obvious sorts of reasons. Um, there's even people that have suggested that it's in other parts of France uh, as well. And likewise, people have suggested in other places within England, such as Wilton, Winchester, all sorts of places. I suppose one thing that we should probably remind ourselves in terms of the manuscript sources is although the manuscripts could have been produced in one place, there is a bias in the surviving material from Canterbury, which again kind of raises Canterbury as an important house, but may kind of um, skew our kind of understanding of, of, of where the tapestry was, was made. And also, of course, um, these manuscripts could have been transported from one place to another, and so could the drawings from them. So although the evidence does point to Canterbury in terms of the um, art historical evidence, if you like, um, it's possible, I suppose, that it could have been produced somewhere else, even if it was inspired by these manuscripts. OK, but but we're, we're broadly saying, well, we are saying that it's, it's an English manuscript made in England uh, by, by English hands uh, in the 1070s. And then the question is, who had it made, and you mentioned earlier the he aspect, but now we're showing a picture of a woman, so to, to, to befuddle matters. So this is a, a picture of Matilda, wife of 
um, uh, William the Conqueror, Queen, his, his queen, and for a long time, um, uh, people said that she must have been the sort of the the, the, the moving power behind the tapestry. Um, not many people would agree with that today. Um, uh, in fact, most people would say that it's Odo of Bayer who was the, uh, the, the the patron of the tapestry. So, who was Odo, and why do do people and we indeed say that it must have been him who was the the driving force? Yeah, well, first of all, I mean, I love this um, illustration um, of Matilda and her ladies weaving the tapestry, and it does create this sort of romantic um, image of how the tapestry may have probably never been produced. Um, but but it's a but it's a beautiful painting. And in terms of Odo, Odo was um, Odo was Bayer, um, was Bishop of Bayer, um, so obviously he was the half brother of Duke William the Conqueror. Um, he came over with his brother um, as during the conquest of England and after the conquest he was made Earl of Kent. Um, he was obviously a very influential person. The Doomsday Book tells us that he was the second largest landholder after the king in the country. So he had massive influence and resources. He had contacts of course abroad. Um, since the Bayer Tapestry was rediscovered if you like um, in Bayer then obviously the connection with Odo being the Bishop of Bayer is, is probably quite important in that. But it's also the case, um, not only that Odo was geographically close to where the tapestry could have been produced if it was produced in Canterbury, but also the tapestry shows individuals that are named in the tapestry that seem to be identified with um, Odo in terms of being his retainers. So the tapestry mentions a guy called Turold, another one called Vital, um, and another guy called Wardard, who we know from other sources are likely to be individuals that were in Odo's, um, his, his men essentially. Yeah, cool. Okay, so we're, so to recap, we're saying made in Canterbury uh, on the orders of, of Odo or, or for him, definitely he's involved in some way uh, in the 1070s, but it then ended up in bio. And we know we don't know where what it did for the first few centuries of its life, um, but we assume it was probably in Bayer. And then the first reference to it really is in the 15th century. Uh, and then it's we know it's in uh, Bayer Cathedral uh, after that. And it's kind of gets a resurgence in the 18th century from this chap, Montfaucon, who I, who I mentioned earlier. So that's that's the that's the basics. And let, let's let's skip on because we haven't got that much time to um, think a little bit about uh, what it's actually talking about. And what it's talking about is, um, is I, as I say here, that the succession crisis of 1066 and uh is that jumped on yeah there we go um so what we're seeing here this is the first frame of the tapestry um and uh this introduces the uh the, the main thrust of, of the story and it's important to say we, the, the the battle of hastings is is a key part of the tapestry everyone knows about that but you don't actually get to the battle scenes for a good way through the tapestry it's about two thirds of the way through before anyone sees uh, that particular piece of fighting the the, the main uh, early chunk of it is about uh, the story that leads up to it. And what we see here is, is Edward Rex. You can see the, the Latin captions at the top. And it's important to say that these captions or titulary, um, they go through the, the tapestry, but um, they're very brief generally, don't tell you too much, um, pretty ambiguous as to what they're actually saying. So they leave a lot of space for interpretation. But this one is pretty clear, Edward Rex, King Edward. He's the guy sat there on the throne uh, with the, the crown and scepter. That's King Edward the Confessor. It doesn't say when this is, um, but other sources by comparison other sources we reckon 1064 uh, or 1065 so towards the end of the reign of king edward the confessor he's been on the throne since 1042 um and he's had a long reign um he's been married to uh, his wife uh, queen edith um but they have not produced a male heir so at this point he's um he's getting towards the end of his life and people are wondering what's going to happen in the succession and he is shown here talking to uh, it's not he's not named specifically but um it's it's harold uh harold uh the earl of wessex harold godwinson uh, son of the old earl godwin so one of those two guys he's talking to is uh, is Harold, who, as we know, then goes on to become King Harold in uh, uh, later on in this story. So um, this is all about uh, setting up what's going on. But the question, I suppose, Michael, is, is was Harold at this point a throne worthy figure? Was he in line to take over? Well, I think he made himself be a throne-worthy figure in many ways, because obviously he was um, the son of Earl Godwin, who was one of the most powerful uh, magnets in England at, at, at 
it, you know, previously he inherited his, his father's lands. And of course, his sister was married to the king. So he wasn't of royal stock directly, um, like other candidates, which we'll talk about um, a bit later. Um, but he had become so powerful within England that it was almost impossible even for Edward to do things without Harold's kind of say so in many ways. And he became really important, um, particularly from the 1050s, I'd say, in ensuring that um, Edward's kingdom was secure. So I suppose, you know, the tapestry is a bit odd here, like Dave was talking about in terms of that it is very ambiguity, it's got a lot of ambiguity to it. It's kind of not very clear about what's sort of happening. We're not told what the purpose of this journey is that Harold is about to go on, but we'll see later um, what that is. But I think um, Harold had put himself into a position where he became quite indispensable really um, to the, 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 the other English um, nobility. And I suppose that's, that's what the tapestry is probably showing us to, to some extent. And then, so as you said, Harold then goes off on a journey. We're not showing this um, in in this um, in this presentation, but there's a, a big old section of the tapestry where Harold um, sails his ship across the uh, English Channel, ends up in uh, northern France, um, uh, gets into the captivity of a chap called Guy of Ponthieu, uh, and then uh, finds himself after that in the hands of. Duke William. And then Duke William and Harold go off on an adventure into Brittany that you mentioned earlier, a military campaign. Harold proves himself to be a kind of worthy military figure. And then it ends, Harold's um, French adventure ends with this really important scene here with, uh, with Harold in the middle here, um, making a sacred oath uh, on what uh, we assume look like uh, some sort of reliquaries. Um, uh, and in the in the company of Duke William sat there on the throne. So this is a really important scene. Um, so what's 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 the score here, Michael? What are we seeing, and why does it significant? Well, I think what's really key here is that the the scene actually does say that he's swearing a sacred oath, but doesn't really say what the oath is about. Now we know from the Norman sources, William of Poitiers and William of Jumieges, that this, or they say at least, this oath was about the promise of the succession of the kingdom, that Harold was promising to help at least, um, help William become King of England after the death of Edward the Confessor. But what's key, and the English sources pick up on this, is that it's not in Harold's gift whatsoever to promise this kingdom. It's not even the gift of the king himself, you know, Edward the Confessor. It's the Witten, the Council of, of Ministers in England that have that promise. Now, obviously, Harold would have had a role in that decision-making process. So he could have helped, I guess, if he wanted um, William to become king. But the reality was, and we'll talk about this a bit more, there was another option already in place. And second to that, um, the English would not really want a Norman to be their king under any circumstances whatsoever. So there was kind of two things against this theory, but Harold, it seems, was in a bit of a, a difficult position um, within finding himself in France, finding himself in captivity, essentially, um, with Duke William. So maybe he just promised anything to get himself out of the trouble that he found himself in. And this, this is an image here that is like absolutely freighted with significance, isn't it? Because you can see everyone's pointing, all eyes are on Harold. This this chap there is pointing up to uh, to the to uh, to sacred up in the uh, in the in the titular. And you can even in the uh, in the upper border, you could even perhaps infer that the creatures are kind of averting their eyes from the perjurious acts that uh, that Harold is uh, is is about to commit. Now that's maybe making too much of an inference, but um, but um, but it's definitely this is a scene that you are required to look at and take notice of because it is really really important what i like dave as well though is that harold's hands are not quite touching it seems sometimes those um, reliquaries so you know maybe it's he's got his fingers crossed behind his back or something like that maybe he never made that promise and of course when he got back to england you know he he, he gained a reputation for making lots of different promises and oaths all over the place yeah, he kind of looks a bit contorted, and there are other places in the tapestry where he looks a little bit uncomfortable in his in his in his very posture. Um, but anyway, so so point is, is that the tapestry is is essentially setting up a clash, a, a, a diametric clash between Harold and William as the two protagonists in the story. Uh, one of whom, Harold, who basically makes an oath, which he then goes back on, and the other man, William, who who makes that uh, cause for him for his. Uh, uh, rightful assault on the throne, essentially. Um, but that overlooks the uh, the small matter of the fact that there was actually someone else in the room 
who was um, uh, a player, a contender for the throw. Uh, a chap called Edgar Effling, here he is. This isn't the tapestry, obviously, this is a, a completely different um, manuscript source, but who was Edgar Effling? Well, Edgar Effling is quite complicated to explain. And one thing I suppose about Norman politics or Anglo-Norman politics at this time is you realize how interrelated and interlinked everyone is. But essentially, um, he is the nephew of Edward the Confessor and he was the grandson of um, Edmund Ironside. So Edmund Ironside was King of England before um, Canute. He, he had a son um, who Canute kind of wanted to do away with, but he was sent to Scandinavia apparently to be kind of killed, um, but he managed to flee um, or get somehow to Hungary, it seems. And there in the royal court, he, he married someone else and he had a son. And it was him um, that was brought back to England, both his, his father, um, Edgar, sorry, Edward, and his, his son, Edgar, so another Edward, not to, just to confuse things a little bit. So, th so this um, Edward and Edgar basically came back to England and as soon as um, Edward um, arrived in England, he died before meeting the King, Edward the Confessor, but he was left with his son, Edgar. And it seems fairly clear from most sources that the King, Edward the Confessor, brought up Edgar as an Etheling, as a throne worthy, so a candidate that could succeed him. And indeed, after the Norman Conquest, the citizens of London um, quite sensibly decided to choose Edgar as King but we'll kind of come back to that perhaps a bit later on. Yeah. So, so Edgar is the uh, basically the closest um, blood relative to Edward the Confessor. Um, he's very much in the frame um, to succeed based on the on the idea of, of uh, blood lineage, which was important at the time, even though the Witten had a had a, an important role in in the choosing as well. Um, uh, but. Edgar, importantly and crucially, is never shown, never talked about in the tapestry. It's all about um, the uh, the clash between William and Harold, um, and and that is significant, and, and there's reasons why that is. So we move on quickly um, from. Harold's return um, from his Norman uh, adventure and making that oath, uh, he goes back and he uh, catches up with the now ailing King Edward the Confessor, um, and he looks a bit uncomfortable in the in the presence of Edward the Confessor, and then very soon Edward the Confessor dies, and this is this is the scene that we see him uh, passing away, um, and this is a really important scene as well. It's kind of a double decker thing here. You can see him his deathbed on the top level and then dead uh, beneath and that obviously um, is very important because it uh, seems to follow uh, the, the documentary sources the um, the life of King Edward um, the, uh, which was written uh, after his death obviously um, um, well actually no, that's, that's not quite true but um, but uh, but it's, it's very it, that follows very closely the, the source there doesn't it so why why is this an important scene Michael? I mean, I love this scene. It's one of my favourite scenes in the Bayer Tapestry. I mean, because obviously you've got this ailing king there. And as you can see from this image, he is touching fingers almost with um, Harold, who's kind of halfway through that image. And at the bottom of the bed is Harold's sister, the king's wife, Edith, and she's sort of weeping. Again, this is another one of these images that seems to be borrowed from the old English hexateuch, both the dying king and, and Edith weeping. But what the Vita Edwardi Regis, so the life of King Edward tells us, is that on Edward's deathbed, he bequeaths or more likely promises the kingdom to Harold's protection. Um, now, there's other sources that say the king was kind of completely not with it on the on on the on his um, deathbed, and he was ranting all sorts of strange things, and people were told to ignore him. But the thrust of it, which uh, I guess um, Harold took away from the whole episode and convinced all of the his, his loyal followers around him was that, that Edward the Confessor had basically promised him um, the crown. And over, it would seem, any earlier promise that was made to William Duke of Normandy, any other promises that could have been made to all sorts of people which we haven't talked about, which seem to be in the background sometimes, and also what designs he may have had for Edgar Etheling to, um, to succeed him. So, Harold seems to take it upon himself at this point um, that he is the rightful heir to Edward the Confessor. And very soon afterwards, here he is on the throne. Um, uh, with, as some, some sources have said, sort of unseemly haste. It's not very long after the death of Edward the Confessor um, that he appears to be uh, crowned. And here he is crowned by 
uh, where you've got the Archbishop Stigand there um, in the scene. Um, is there is there a particular message in this scene, Michael, that we ought to be aware of? Well, first, in terms of the timing, I think it's really important that Anglo-Saxon kings did tend to be crowned at major feasts. And of course, you know, fortunately or not, Edward the Confessor had died at Christmas tide. So everyone was together and it made practical sense i suppose for um, harold for a number of reasons he probably was expecting you know an invasion of some sort and he got two um but um so he probably knew that the kingdom was insecure you know rather than kind of wait until easter which was obviously the next major kind of feast scene he could um kind of deal with it now and then so essentially you know edward died on one day before the body was even kind of cold in the ground um, Harold had the crown on his head, as we see in this, this picture here. But I think what's really important in terms of the Bayer tapestry is that Harold is being shown as a king. He is being clearly shown as a legitimate ruler. Some people have questioned whether Stigand being there because he was kind of not kind of frowned on a little bit by the church um, kind of says something against that. But compared with the Norman sources that almost refused, well, basically they do refuse to acknowledge um, Harold as a king, the Bayer tapestry is, is very different. And, and I, I think that's really interesting. And in, in our book, Dave and myself kind of explain exactly why that is the case. Yeah, so as you said, the, the caption here, Harold Rex Anglorum is a clear statement of, uh, of the fact that he is king there. Um, and throughout Harold is treated as a as a, a worthy figure quite often like someone to be lauded and applauded um not um as you might imagine in a tapestry which is uh celebrating the victory of the Normans you would might imagine that he would be sort of talked down but actually he's shown to be a pretty a pretty important and in some ways heroic figure um and there there are reasons for that because they're trying to create this this dual approach between William and Harold and Harold needs to be quite a, a good and manly figure that William beats um, to make the story a good story. Yeah, and obviously it doesn't really help the story for Edgar Etheling to be any part of this because um, for William's claim on the English throne, he needs to have um, defeated a perjuring king, which he sort of does if he defeats Harold and ignores the fact that Edgar Etheling is kind of hovering in the background. So it suits William and it suits Harold for this to be a dual battle between the two. Right, let's uh, let's nip on. We've done half an hour, so as I suspected, we're going to run out of time. But very quickly, warfare in the Bayer Tapestry. Now, obviously, a lot of military historians and people who are interested in military history take a lot from uh, the tapestry because it shows a lot of military stuff. Um, uh, and it's not just Hastings. So this scene is from the Brittany campaign that Michael mentioned earlier. This is Dinon, uh, the, the, uh, the castle of Dinon. Um, uh, and uh, it's it's a very interesting bit of story because it's not really shown uh, very much anywhere other than in the bias tapestry. Um, and there are lots of interesting reasons why that might be. But I think we should leave that as a question, maybe, for people if they want to chat about the Brittany campaign. And let's skip on to the Battle Royale itself, the Battle of Hastings. So once Harold's had himself crowned, um, the tapestry then has... Uh, numerous frames where it shows William's response to that. William's response is fast and uh, angry. He uh, convenes his, uh, his, his forces, he builds a fleet, and uh, he, in short order, sails across uh, and, and uh, encamps in southern England. And Odo is important in this. It's the first time we start to see Bishop Odo as a figure who's sort of helping to orchestrate that, um, which is uh, sort of grist to the mill of the idea that Odo is an important figure in the production of the tapestry. But when you get to the uh, the battle scene itself, so uh, what it doesn't show, actually, it's important to mention, uh, the tapestry doesn't show the battles that happened to the north of England um, uh, between, the, uh, between the period of William's landing in Pevensey and the Battle of Hastings. And those were the battles of Fulford and Stamford Bridge um, when the uh, Norwegian King Harold Ardrada invaded with Harold Godwinson's brother Tosti. Uh, and there are a couple of battles, battles there which uh, Harold, King Harold uh, uh, eventually um, was victorious uh, at Stamford Bridge and beat Harold Hardrada, which is a very important thing um, because Hardrada was a, a, an important military figure in, in Europe at the time. So uh, something to 
to of note uh, something to be talked about and yet completely ignored in the tapestry um and um, we'll probably talk about it in just a second but this scene here so we finally get to the battle of hastings and we have a very long section showing the battle uh and just this this particular scene here um we've picked out just because we wanted to point up the fact that um though it shows us lots of interesting things about arms and armament um it doesn't the the tapestry doesn't really um, uh, pick out differences between the Normans and the English in terms of the arms and armour that they were using. There are some differences, but mostly it's quite hard to tell who's who. Yeah, that's right. Although um, at the Battle of Hastings scene, it's only the Normans, um, apart from one instance, who are mounted, and it's always the Anglo-Saxons that are on, um, standing up. They, like Dave says, both the Normans and the Anglo-Saxons mostly have the same arms and armour, but occasionally the Anglo-Saxons will have round shields scattered uh, amongst them. So what you see here is something about how the two armies did actually fight. We did know that there was a substantial cavalry in the, the Norman troops, and we know the Anglo-Saxons um, or the English were on the higher ground, which they defended. And you, saw, you seem to see some sort of inklings of that um, within the tapestry depictions. For example, here, you can see the Anglo-Saxons forming um, a shield wall. Um, but other times, it seems that different characteristics are given to the Anglo-Saxon Normans at certain points, just to help you as the reader or the viewer go through the tapestry and make sense of what's going on. Because as we'll see in the next slide, it becomes completely chaotic um, what happens in, in the Bayer tapestry. You've got horses falling over. You've got these men, as you can see on the higher ground here, which we presume to be Anglo-Saxons. But again, because the designer uses certain attributes to kind of bring out the English and the Anglo-Saxons, in a very subtle way, we kind of get a sense of what's going on amongst this, this chaos. But as Dave said, one of the kind of fascinating things about the Battle of Hastings is though we often think about the Bayer Tapestry as being a depiction of this battle, it's right at the end, as, as it should be, I suppose, um, but it's only a fraction of the length of the, the tapestry, really. Um, it's quite a significant length, but still it's the most of the tapestry is about the build up to this battle rather than the battle itself. Yeah, and there's definitely an, a, a, a clear sense of chaos um, through what you see, and, and the, um, though they, the, the tapestry designers are clearly trying to show a certain element of narrative, it doesn't necessarily completely match up with what you uh, read in the other documentary sources. There are some, there are quite a few differences between the two, which probably just is, a, is indicative of the fact that a battle in the 11th century was no doubt a very messy affair, and it was quite hard to keep track of what was going on. But yeah, you can see here probably English people with their moustaches, um, which are, is sort of often indicative of, of the Anglo-Saxons. On a, on a bit of higher ground here. This might be referencing the, the Malfoss incident where um, some of uh, William's cavalry um, fell in, in a water course, but um, it, it's, not, um, it's not completely clear. And then let's skip on to uh, probably the most famous scene in the Bayer Tapestry, Harold famously getting the arrow in the eye. Um, and Michael, you'd better just quickly explain whether that is accurate or not. Yeah, well, one thing that we haven't talked about is that the fact that the Bayer Tapestry has been substantially restored, um, mostly in the 19th century, it seems, probably on the drawings um, made by Charles Stottard, um, who was sent by the Society of Antiquities to go and, um, and, and draw the Bayer Tapestry so England could have its own version of these events. So what is hard to see sometimes in the tapestry although once you get your eye and you can see them, is where these kind of changes and modifications and restorations have been made. And one thing that's really fascinating is this, of Harold being killed with an arrow in the eye. Because if you look at the earlier drawings um, of the Bayer tapestry made by Montfaucon and, and others, this arrow in the eye does not exist. It seems to be a spear that this man seems to be holding. But of course, when Stottard come to, came to the tapestry, it had been damaged quite a lot at its ends, both at the, the end and the beginning, um, and including this scene here. And of course, Stottard knew that Harold had died with an arrow in his eye. So when he saw the stitch holes of the arrow, he kind of, in his drawings, kind of recreated them as, as, as arrows. And indeed, he stuck a few arrows in the shields of these men around as well for good measure. So there is a question really about whether Harold really died with an arrow in the eye and whether the Bayer Tapestry actually does show Harold with an arrow in his eye, um, especially since the earliest references um, 
to this arrow death scene seem to be in the 12th century rather than contemporary accounts. So, you know, maybe Harold never died with an arrow in the eye. In fact, I, I probably believe he never did. He was more likely hacked to death. And indeed, some people looking at this ski scene, and I go with this as well, have seen Harold as, a, as, as one of the individuals, but the other guy falling down as well as being another Harold. So you kind of get a sequence here of him standing up and then being hacked down. And indeed, the first, the earliest contemporary accounts do seem to suggest that it was um, Harold did die by being mashed up. Indeed, there's a kind of famous tale that his lover only identified him um, by special marks on his body only known to her, rather than the fact that he had much of his face left to be identified. Yeah, but uh, so it, whether or not he died of an arrow, he definitely is dead in this picture. Harold Rex interfects as uh, Harold King Harold is dead. So, um, so there's there's no doubt of the fact that he does um, does meet his end at the Battle of Hastings in the tapestry. Although, um, of course, Dave, there are accounts that Harold did survive uh, as well, um, okay. but we won't go there. <laughs> for us. Okay, let's let's move on from martial matters very quickly. We've got uh, about seven minutes left, Michael. So we're going to quickly talk about women in the bio tapestry, which is a very interesting topic, and I know you, you're doing a, a bit of research on it now. Um, there, you you might not be too surprised to, to hear that there aren't very many women shown in the main frieze of the of the tapestry. There's only three women shown. One, two, three. Um, uh, there are some other. Um, women shown in the borders um, uh, in various um, various different poses and, and uh, various different um, stages of, of undress. Um, but in the in the main freeze, there's three women. There's this um, famous scene of Elf Gifu, um, the woman who's kind of levitating here in the middle of these pillars. And then there is uh, the scene that we just talked about earlier, Queen the bed of King Edward the Confessor. And then there is a further scene. Uh, this is um, after the um, Normans have made their bridgehead in uh, Pevensey and they start to, uh, to burn houses in southern England. And th here we see a woman seemingly leading a child away from a burning house. So those are the three women who appear in the tapestry in the main frieze um, uh, and only one of them is actually named. Um, but it's, it's very interesting that they appear at all and it's very interesting that there's so few of them um, and one of the things that, that people have talked about and I know that you're interested in is, is, is sort of where they appear in the tapestry they, they appear seem to appear at sort of key moments and kind of stop you make you think maybe that there's something that you ought to be aware of yeah I mean given that you know women were very much involved with the creation of the tapestry you know it on the surface of it at least it's a real surprise that there's not more women in the tapestry indeed you know if you look at the manuscripts that influence the tapestry, you see loads of women um, in there. And there's no reason that a tapestry designer could have put more women in, or even the embroiderers could have stuck more women in, but they didn't. And like Dave says, it kind of suggests that there's a stop, think about it, uh, in, in, in the tracks, as it were. Now, the Alf Giva lady at the beginning, um, we've got no idea really who she is. There's lots of theories that have been battered about who she is. And I've got a, an article um, coming out, hopefully, in, in the next year or so that kind of demystifies it all or not. Um, but anyway, it certainly, it certainly shows that there's lots of people that could have been um, this woman. And we don't know what's happening to her, but the, the suggestion is because this guy um, in the border below is naked and mimics the cleric who kind of touches her face or slaps her face, that there's some sort of sexual aspect to this encounter. So you know, she's somehow being threatened or she's been abused, perhaps something like that, potentially. Um, obviously with Edith, who we've already talked about, she is, you know, mourning the death of her um, husband. I always wonder how much Edith actually did mourn the death of Edward the Confessor, because she, to me, seemed uh, one of these women that was very, you know, did very well in many respects, even after the Norman Conquest, she made pretty much a name for herself. And maybe she was the the woman behind the crown and even her brother um, in, in the 1060s, but maybe that's for another day. Um, and then of course, the, the, the next one, which is a really, in some ways quite a surprising scene, if you do see the Bayer Tapestry as a piece of Norman propaganda, which we've sort of argued against, because you know this shows the Normans essentially um, causing, you know, burning down the houses of the local population and causing, you know, victimizing kind of women as well. So it's, it's quite a, it kind of brings the kind of the nature of warfare directly home 
um, to how traumatic it must have been for those Anglo-Saxons in the countryside when um, William came over and started to waste the countryside in order to entice, it seems, Harold down. So yeah, these women are all in states of, um, of, of, of kind of mourning, panic, duress, um, violent aspects. And indeed, the naked women in the borders um, are hard to understand, but for some of them at least, they definitely um, threatened by, by men as well. So you kind of wonder, I suppose, to what extent the women creating these scenes um, who produced the Bayer Tapestry were thinking or relating to the meanings behind these various depictions. You know, they may have been Anglo-Saxon women, for example, who were embroidering the tapestry, who had experienced this abuse by men and this, um, this, this kind of um, wasting of the countryside that they were part of. So, yeah, like, like you say, I'm, I'm doing some, some more work with this with a colleague from, from Norway, um, where we're really interested in kind of getting behind the women of the Bayer Tapestry. Right, now we've got two minutes, I think, to do the legacy of the biotapestry, so we'd better be quick, but it has a long legacy. Um, uh, and it's been um, much discussed, much um, uh, been a, a source of much interest for lots of people ever since it kind of resurfaced in the 18th century. Napoleon um, famously um, uh, was very interested in it, and as were the Nazis in the Second World War. Um, and here, here are a couple of them uh, having a look at the tapestry, um, why were they interested in the tapestry? Yeah, the Germans, they, have, they had kind of two groups of Germans, really, during the Second World War that were interested in tapestry. There was a group that were interested in preserving cultural objects, and there was a group that was interested in the German ancestry. Now, of course, the Normans um, were originally from Scandinavia. They'd landed in, in, in Normandy as Vikings, essentially, and they'd become Normans, and then they'd become... Um, kind of Frankified, I suppose, over time. But the Germans were quite interested in those um, Viking roots of the, the Normans, and essentially they saw the Bear Tapestry as a, a way in to understanding the Germanic roots of the, the Norman people. So that's why the Germans were, were interested in it. And indeed, um, you know, very high ranking, um, you know, during the Second World War, when Paris fell and the Bayer Tapestry had been moved to the, the Louvre Valley, um, Heinrich Himmler actually wanted or gave an order while Paris was falling um, to the Allies to have the tapestry removed and taken back to Germany. But by that time, the Louvre had been taken by the Americans. So he just about missed out and maybe we'd never have the Bayer Tapestry or his story at the end would be very different. But, but like you say, Napoleon also had a, a fascination with the Bayer Tapestry when he was thinking about um, invading Britain. Um, so it has been a, a, a kind of point of stimulation and interest for people kind of reinterpreting um, history. Um, and I think we all should remind ourselves that we do reinterpret history in our own way all the time. It's, yeah, so it's had a few scrapes and it's and it's we're very lucky that it has survived. It, it hasn't survived completely intact. I think it's worth saying that the uh, that the end of it, after that scene of Harold dying, um, there's a there's a couple more frames of the of the um, conclusion of the Battle of Hastings, and then it peters off in a very ragged fashion. And it's very ragged because um, for for some years, when tourists came to visit, it was kind of unwound off this kind of bucket wrench type thing, uh, and that no doubt wasn't very good. So we don't actually know what the end of the tapestry was. That hasn't stopped lots of people from thinking about it. And here is um, is one effort. It's called the it's from the Alderney tapestry, the Alderney Thinial, and this is kind of follows a, a quite a few. Uh, a, a fairly common line of thought that the last scene of the tapestry would be the crowning of King William uh, in Westminster Abbey um, after his successful move from Hastings through the country to London um, uh, over the course of the next few months. Um, so this is this is kind of a good example of the legacy um, uh, in action, isn't it? It's, it continues to be used as a historical source um, uh, even down today. Yeah, and, they, and, you, and you go all over the country and you see these kind of things that are influenced by the Bayer Tapestry and tell the story of local communities. For example, I did a bit of stitching, as I like to say, on the on the, the Bayer, um, sorry, the Battle Tapestry. And, the, you know, there's lots of these different versions. But one of the ones that's really interesting is that is the next one, I think, that we're going to show, which I, I, I've, I've seen, actually, I went to, to Belfast and saw, and I was absolutely amazed by this, this object. So... This is the game. This is the Game of Thrones tapestry, and and this was produced um, to promote the Irish linen industry. Um, and what I think is amazing about this object is that it um, it's 
grown as the Game of Thrones um, series continued. To, so to start with, it was quite small, but then as it as the as the series continued, they added more and more to it until you got the whole of the Game of Thrones version of the of the Bayer Tapestry. What I like about it is, in some ways, it's much more bloodthirsty as you'd expect than the Bayer Tapestry itself. But um, it is pretty amazing the way that the imagery is created in that Bayer Tapestry style. And of course, Dave and myself, we went to the Canadian Embassy a few years ago to see the Black Gold Tapestry, which is a tapestry in Bayer Tapestry style, the same length and size as the Bayer Tapestry, but tells um, the story of the, the, the oil industry in, in Canada. So such an amazing difference to the Bayer Tapestry and for another completely different purpose. But they are, these these kind of runoffs, if you like, are kind of fascinating, aren't they? Yeah, we had a fascinating chat with the, the lady responsible for that, Sandra. And, and that's just one example of, of many of people's reusing the style and format of the tapestry. It's kind of, it, it's a meme, it's used on, you know, there's a thing on the internet where you can kind of create your own tapestry stories to illustrate current events and things like that. It still continues to dominate um, uh, ways of thinking about um, uh, sort of demonstrating, well, it, it, today's events. It, it's still got power. And that's one of the reasons why it's so interesting and so valuable. Um, and and uh, do you want to quickly talk about this uh, this little thing? Yeah, well, I saw this recently and I thought, you know, given we are obviously still in the pandemic, it, it, it's a, a, a kind of nice way of, of how the tapestry, you know, could be used, I suppose, in the modern era, but I wouldn't advise it, where you might use it to kind of, um, you know, blow your nose before you um, <laughs> before you kind of get on public transport. But this is an advert um, for Khan, and um, you can see they're kind of inspired by the COVID pandemic to, to, to and relinking it with the, the Bayer tapestry. So like Dave says, really, it's, it's kind of a way of um, using the tapestry in, in lots of different sorts of um, contexts. And I've seen some really good recent cartoons um, based on the relationship, particularly between England and France, but also England and Europe, um, that uses the Bayer Tapestry imagery as inspiration for talking about kind of topics of the day. Yeah, and I suppose the point for us that we talk about in the book, um, which is which is our sort of, one of our lines, is the fact that it is so powerful and it has dominated um, our understanding of the of the of the 1066 campaign and what happened. Um, the we the, kind of the fact that Edgar, poor old Edgar Effling, is excluded from the tapestry means that he is often excluded from our popular understanding of what happened um, during the conquest. And and a lot of a lot of the time we do tend to see the conquest as this diametric battle between these two figures, Harold and William, when um, we forget that there was actually a, a serious contender for the throne in the background who's kind of written out of history to a lot of extent because he doesn't appear in the tapestry. Yeah, and we've put him back. We put him back and, and, and read the book to, to find out more about it. But look, we've uh, we've 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 run over time, so we better stop and take some questions. And I just need to look at this little thing and see. Oh crikey, all the questions are really really long. Um, let's have a little look. Um, okay, there's a question here about. Um, it's basically asking uh, the, the idea about whether the Anglo-Saxon women working on the embroidery use subtle means to to have a dig at the Norman invaders. Um, yeah. we, we don't we don't give too much credence to that, do we? No, I mean I think you would be um, fairly crazy, I suppose, um, as a, an Anglo-Saxon woman to kind of have a dig at the Normans because I don't think they would they would not understand that. I mean I think we're talking about a period now where Anglo-Saxons and Normans are living side by side, if somewhat uncomfortably, um, still. And um, yeah, I don't think you'd get away with it, essentially. Um, but it is. But the point is that, I mean, obviously that we make as work, have made already is that the tapestry is much more balanced and sympathetic to the Anglo-Saxon perspective than it might seem to start with. It's not a piece of Norman propaganda that rubs it in. It's trying to make sense of what was a very confused event um, in 1066 with lots of different views on what had just happened. And sometimes I equate it to the Brexit thing, you know, some people were expecting it to happen and some people weren't. And it's like, whoa, what just happened then? And we've got a population that is quite diverse in its views on what is the answers of that problem. Yeah, okay. A couple of questions here on design. Um, the tapestry design has a, has a strong cartoon-like design. Are there any other surviving examples in Europe or Asia that, um, that follow it? I mean, the, the, the thing about the tapestry is that it is pretty unique in terms of its survival, but one assumes that there would have been um, other things that are similar. There's the, the Oseberg tapestry that seems to be um, similar, and there are, there are documentary references that describe 
things that sound similar to the tapestry or could in fact be describing the tapestry itself. Um, but but the but the tap bio tapestry is um, singular in its survival. Yeah, I mean, we don't have really much surviving in terms of late Anglo-Saxon textiles or even European textiles at this sort of time, apart from the ones you've mentioned in in sort of Scandinavia. So uh, we wouldn't think it was unique, put it that way, um, but it's become unique to some extent. Yeah. And then a follow up there, was there an initial cartoon drawn up that the needlewoman followed? If so, who was likely to have drawn the visor? I mean, that's a really good question. And it, yeah. Obviously, there has to have been some template, and there, there are lots of. Uh, there's, there's quite an interesting idea that there, there's sort of, um, uh, bits of it seem to be quite formulaic in terms of like there may have been stenciled patterns that were reused to 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 allow for certain things to be um, reproduced. Clearly, there must have been a design, or else it would have just been a, a hodgepodge. But we don't know who did that or or specifically how it was done. But we know that they would have been following. Um, using some of the, the manuscripts that you mentioned earlier to as sort of um, exemplars. Yeah, I mean, I would have thought that there would have been a charcoal outline at the very least on this linen um, that, that the embroiderers were destined to follow. One of the questions, you know, which we haven't kind of looked at because we haven't had time really is, is the kind of relationship between the main frieze and the borders, because I think within the borders, there's probably more potential for people to kind of insert different sorts of designs or, or add to it in, in different sorts of ways. And it's clear actually from the tapestry fabric itself that the embroiderers have misunderstood elements of the design and they've made mistakes that sometimes seem fairly obvious. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that they are following some sort of design for, the, for most of it that's been created by someone else. And even, you know, as I said in my PhD thesis very many, many years ago now, um, that, that, it, that it's quite possible that the designer wasn't even there at the embroidery stage. So they didn't even look back over what the embroiderers had done. Um, otherwise, some of these mistakes might have been sorted out. There's there's some really interesting work that's been done on the on the design side of things. Um, a, a lady called uh, Alexandra Lester Macon has written a really good book on sort of Anglo-Saxon embroidery, and she's she's very interested. In it. And um, actually, Michael and I we did a, a podcast series for for my History Extra podcast where we have an episode where we talk at length about that. So um so go and check that out because we have a lot of a lot of conversation about that. Um, Mike, a question that I, I mentioned we probably would get. Um, uh, someone's asking, uh, they recall there was an announcement the tapestry could be exhibited in the UK. Is yeah, so, so President Macron announced um, um, that, he, that the Bayer tapestry would be um, loaned to the United Kingdom, subject to it being able to travel. Um, and that stands, that's a kind of an agreement, an official agreement that's made between the UK and, and French governments. So, you know, that's on the cards to happen. But at the moment, what's happening is that the, um, the tapestry is going to have to have some sort of conservation work for its re-exhibit um, in Bayer. Like Dave said at the beginning, um, Bayer Museum is being redeveloped and the Bayer tapestry is going to be put into a, a new kind of display, essentially. And I'm on the scientific committee that's helping sort of advise them with that. So that conservation work is, is going to take some time. So, you know, whilst there was, uh, I suppose, in the news, quite a lot of, uh, of, of story, I suppose, about the fact that it was all seemed pretty immediate, that it was going to be shipped over. It's not going to happen like next week or the week after that. It's going to be a few years probably before this sort of happens. But I mean, hopefully it does, because I think, you know, it'd be absolutely amazing thing for the Bayer Tapestry to be displayed in this country. Um, obviously, you know, there's an opportunity to kind of celebrate, maybe not the right word, the Norman conquest uh, and the, the kind of relationship that's developed, um, you know, with, with France and Europe um, since um, 1066 as well. So I think it's, it could be a really exciting kind of look at this sort of period um, of, of time. And I think it would clearly be an absolute blockbuster exhibition um, if it did come over to England. You know, people would be queuing around the block um, to come and see it. And it would real, it would be a real signal moment in in uh, in history and historiography in um, in in England and Britain. And I think we I think this is a record breaking webinar in terms of the number of people attending it. And there is so there is obviously a massive interest in the biotapestry. I'm sure I'm sure you would all be flocking to it wherever you are in the world to come and look at it. Um, we've got a a question here on Edgar, our friend Edgar, um, wondering what happened to Edgar once Harold was defeated. And that is really, really interesting. So as you, as you mentioned, um, uh, some people did acclaim Edgar as king after Harold's defeat, um, but they, they petered away quite quickly in the face of the, of the power of Normans. Um, and William was, was crowned despite that. But Edgar then has a really interesting life after that, um, sort of within and without William's court, 
um, and his, his family also has an interesting life as well. His sister, Margaret, um, uh, marries into the Scottish court, um, to, to the Scottish king, and, uh, and, and Edgar spends some time up there as well. So he becomes very involved in the power play between England and Scotland um, and has a, has a very interesting life. And it's one of the most interesting things about him, I think, is, is how he manages to navigate being sort of friends and enemies and then friends again with William and his sons, um, and 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 there must have been something quite special about him, I think, to have been able to to survive. He was a survivor. He lived for quite a long time and ended up going on crusade in the end, um, probably. Um, so so he had a pretty interesting life, didn't he? Yeah, I don't know whether it's something in the DNA of that sort of family. If thinking of Edward the Confessor, the way that he was sort of one minute completely no chance of being king, and then suddenly does. Um, and then even you know Earl Godwin as well, you know, in and out of favour, if you like, but. It is amazing how Edgar, like you say, kind of circumnavigates the politics of the 11th century and doesn't find himself chopped up at some point and manages to survive it all. Yeah. Um, let's have a, is it a question about norms? Are any norms are close to your heart? Um, tapestry, well, they are, you, you like the norms. Uh, the tapestry refers to the norms as Franks at some points, I believe, rather than Normans. Would you read anything into this? Um, the, the question is asking whether the Normans sort of seem themselves as quite patriotic and separate from French, um, if you see what I mean. Um, so I think I think the question is asking about how far this is a Norman production, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm I'm really, as you know, I'm really interested in this kind of relationship between Normandy and the, the rest of France. And I think one of the things that is kind of fascinating about the Bear Tapestry generally is that you know, William the Conqueror um, in 1066 doesn't really get much of a, a kind of a, a role in French history in a way, but for the Normans, obviously, he's kind of fundamentally important. Um, and it's kind of the way, again, kind of, I suppose, history is written, that because, you know, William of Normandy was never a French king, he doesn't really count in, in history. Um, so there's definitely a kind of a uniqueness um, you know, through the Bayer Tapestry that links England, Anglo-Saxon England and, and, and Normandy particularly. And indeed, you know, when we've been talking about the loan of the Bayer Tapestry and, you know, telling the story of the, the Norman conquest, you know, within Bayer, they're, they're very mindful that there's a kind of relationship between England and, and Normandy that is bigger in some respects than that between England and France. And indeed, of course, you know, what adds to that, of course, is the is the fact that the that Normandy was the first place liberated during the Second World War. And of course, nowadays, a lot of people go to Normandy to see one, the landing beaches where the Allies um, landed um, to liberate um, Bayeux and other um, towns, which of course, Bayeux was the first to be liberated. Um, and, and they also go and see the Bayer Tapestry, which tells about the other sort of story. And if you go to the, the War Memorial, the cemetery, the British cemetery in Bayeux, um, there's an epitaph there um, which basically kind of reads that we, um, who were defeated by William the Conqueror, his sons have come back to free the homeland sort of thing. So it is an amazing sort of relationship. And I think that's why um, indeed this work on the Bayer Tapestry that we're doing and the kind of redesign of the Bayer Museum and the potential loan of the Bayer Tapestry are so important because it, it does link people that have been you know, brought together by history. Yeah, and I think um, Antoine, the curator of the museum, told me that um, the, the number of visitors to the Tapestry Museum are, are from England or Britain far outweigh those who visit from France, which kind of um, uh, proves your point that um, uh, Norman history and French history aren't necessarily this one and the same thing. Although he's probably talking about um, France as being outside Normandy, because I think there's a lot of Norman children that go into the Bay of Tapestry, but not non-Norman not no, non Norman French. <laughs> okay, we're we're ending in a wildly befuddled fashion. So it's uh, it's clearly getting to uh, to the end of the hour. In fact, it is the end of the hour. So there was loads more questions we haven't managed to get through um, half of them. But thank you so much. There was loads of really brilliant in depth questions um, that. Uh, we could have spent a long time talking about, we could have talked about reliquaries um, and what's missing at the end and uh, hard rada, uh, also uh, illumination, all sorts of all sorts of things. So, so sorry, loads of, loads of really good questions, um, mostly covered in, in our book. Um, so do have a look at that um, if you want to get chapter and verse on it.
um, hopefully it's a good read um, and uh, and you will find more answers there um, but I think we ought to wrap up so um, remains for me to say thank you very much for coming along I hope you enjoyed the conversation um, and uh, I can't think if there was anything else was I supposed to say Michael was there see you next time see you next time that's it thank you very much and good night <laughs>